of what I'm going to say is either correct or sworn in already. So, if you sort of drift off, I won't mind really. Um, anyway, okay, so this is the title of uh, my talk What Metadata Are Needed to Make Raw Data from ESRF MX Beamlines Intelligible. Um, well, at the MX Beamlines, we do MX experiments. Uh, you all know this. Um, which one is the which one is the laser thing? I have no idea. Sorry. Ah, right, I thought that was the off button. Okay, so we start with um, <laughs> some crystals. Um, we put them on a diffractometer or something. We collect some raw diffraction images. We reduce these uh, diffraction images to get the information we need to get our crystal structure. Um, oh, no, I didn't do that. Do I? Yeah. Um, and as Harry Powell never forgets to tell us when he's giving a talk, the data collection step, so this bit here from crystals to raw diffraction images, is the last and probably the most important step of an MX experiment. Now, as you also know, third generation MX synchrotron uh, beam lines are extremely intense and coupled with new detector technology, pixel detector technology and such like, it means that we can collect a complete set of raw diffraction images from any given sample extremely quickly. Um, if we really wanted to show off, we could probably do it in less than a second uh, quite easily, although that doesn't happen so often. But because we can go so quickly and high throughput is, um, well, throughput is extremely high, what all SR synchrotron source MX facilities are doing is we're providing automatic experiment planning and execution as well as online and that means at beamline auto processing so that's reduction of the data so go from this to this and the correct collection um, use and archiving of the method of metadata for this part of the experiment are required to make sure that our users know well, they can interpret the results of the auto-processing correctly. Uh, that's the first thing. And the second thing, so that it, we need this metadata to allow offline reprocessing or, or, uh, of the data after an experimental session. Oops, no, I don't need that. Sorry, I keep doing that, don't I? Um, just as an aside, experiment control at the SRF is via uh, a BCM, I should say, a beamline control module. That was a Freudian slip. The BCU stands for the Beamline Control Unit, um, <laughs> called MXQ, um, of which the business end is here, really. We can either, or users can either set up their experiment parameters explicitly in this little, uh, these boxes here, or semi-automatically using a series of workflows that we have down here. Once this has been done, um, we can add all this information to a queue, click, collect queue, and what we've defined here will be carried out by the, the BCM. Oh no, I keep doing that. Sorry. <laughs> so, used to, um, so what metadata do we need um, to describe an MX data collection? Well, basically we need to know stuff about the primary beam, the incident beam, what we've done with the crystal, um, and also what our detector is like. What are the characteristics of our detector. Um, and all the metadata we collect, you've seen this exact slide earlier on actually, um, are stored in ISPY-B, which stands for Information System for Protein Crystallography Beamlines, is where the Y comes from. Um, I won't bother explaining this uh, too much, as Pierre has already done it uh, quite nicely, but basically all the metadata we need are stored in ISPY-B. Now, ISPY-B itself is not just a LIMS, actually, um, a laboratory information management system. It's also a metadata catalogue. And the great thing about ISPY-B is it has a modular data model. So we can um, add any data tables for any, anything we like, really, and in particular for any experiment we like. And I guess uh, the biggest thing to uh, bring out about ISPY-B is that it links samples with data collection and with the auto-processing results. We also have here something for screening. I think Simon mentioned earlier on. Um, it's important 
if we take several, if we make a load of tests on different types of crystals or different, different crystals of the same type, we need to know the results of these as well. Um, this is the data collection module of Ice by B. I don't expect you to read it, um, I can't even read it from here either. But basically, in this table here is where we define all the metadata that we need for the experiment and store all the, the metadata we need for the experiment. And this is then passed on to the auto processing module. Um, and the metadata itself is used to create an input file for data processing programs, in this case um, XDS. We use XDS for our auto processing, uh, online auto processing. And depending on how we run it, we can either run just a straight through quick and dirty approach, or we can use a much, much more robust uh, approach. And depending on how we use it, um, we either go straight from this input file into here, or if we use this uh, more robust approach, this is um, updated depending on the results of various, um, uh, of various uh, parts of this uh, system here. And then all the results of all of this are again stored in iSpyB here. Um, if users want to see um, which me what metadata we've stored in iSpyB, that's fairly straightforward. This is uh, the auto processing tab of iSpyB. We have, first we have the results of the, of the data reduction, if you like, for all of the point groups um, which are consistent with the unit cell dimensions uh, of, the, of the crystal. But here we store the experiment parameters. You can see them here, you can hardly see them, but things like the phi start, um, what the effective oscillation range is, and what the exposure time is, stuff like that. And in here, this is uh, the beamline parameters actually. Um, uh, so what the energy of the incident x-rays are, we actually tell you what the undulator types are, what the gaps are and stuff like that. Things that you don't really need actually for, for data reduction, but um, we store them anyway. And also what the incident flux of the beam line is. Um, one other thing that we need to be able to reprocess the data actually is to know stuff about something about the detector. And if I go back, sorry, here in, um, this is a XDS input file. Here is some information about the detector. And these basically tell you where the gaps are in the, between the modules in the, the, the pixel detector. And here, this thing here, these are the files that um, basically describe uh, the misorientations between the modules because they're never exactly flat and stuff like that. So not only do we need um, like I said before, not only do we need to know about the incident beam and what we did with the crystal, we also need to know the detector characteristics in order to be able to interpret the raw data images properly. And these are actually for reprocessing. These um, correction files, we call them, are actually downloadable from ice by the, by the users. And then we also have a whole series of tabs here. I've just shown one which show the data quality for any one of these um, given runs that we've done of the auto processing. Um, if you want to reprocess the data, like I say, um, we have the input file which is created by MX Cube is also downloadable and could be just run on a command line or whatever. XDS minus par is what uh, we usually use. Um, so that's fairly straightforward for XDS. Again, this input file contains all the, everything we need, including information about the detector. If you use other, or, uh, other uh, data processing programs such as MOSFILM, where you don't have such a complete description of the experiment, metadata is also stored in the header of the images, from the, in this case, from a Pilatus uh, 6M. So we have all the information that you need to be able to re reprocess the data and it's all stored in Ice by B, and it's all downloadable and recoverable. So you can basically repeat the data reduction step. Um, and this basically just says what I've said before. So all the metadata that we need is, um, is um, sorry, is stored in Ice by B. 
both the experiment parameters, so what we did with the crystal basically, beamline parameters, and then all the information you need about the detector, etc. Yeah. So the conclusion there is that the metadata from data collection experiments are reasonably well archived in ice 5 e and are available quite straightforwardly actually to either the experimenter or to beamline managers. One thing they're not available to is anybody else. Okay, so Joe Bloggs just can't come along and find out um, what's happened or what's, some, what's been done in a particular experiment. Um, so that's good. The downside is that reprocessing, at least at the SRF, is also is only available on a very short-term basis, actually. Um, we don't, well, images are on our central storage system, so basically they're available online for about 30 days or something like that. And then on a slightly longer term, six month uh, term, you can get them downloaded back onto the, the central server. Sorry, Tom. Yeah. Um, it's sort of tradition more than anything else, I think. I think since the SRF started, I think the general idea has been that users data uh, uses data, and it's not the problem of the SRF to to keep this for them. Although, I mean, I guess one of the, <laughs> the aims of this meeting is to decide whether it is or not, actually. And if it is, well, on our beam lines taken together, we collect thousand data sets a day. I don't know what that adds up to in terms of petabytes or terabytes or whatever, but it's a, a lot of data. And as uh, I think Pierre said earlier, or Brian, for, for structural biology beamlines anyway, it, it quite rapidly adds up to a monumental amount of data actually. Um, so whether the SRF could do that on its own, I don't think so. Um, yeah, I don't think so. I, and so, so it's sort of tradition and funding, I guess, yeah? Okay, so the experiment metadata is actually well catalogued, archived, and retrievable. But if we really want to be able to interpret the raw images, I suppose what we need to do in the end is to see how well the structure that we get out, that we get from these raw images, well, how these two, um, uh, yeah, if there's a strong correlation between these two raw data and the structure that we get out. Um, and to do that, we need to know something about our samples. And unfortunately, something that I Spy B is not very good at, at least not at the moment, is storing information about samples. Uh, this is our sample metadata um, module. Uh, it looks quite complete, actually, but as far as the actual sample itself is concerned, there's very little contained. Basically, all it says, all, all this says is that I have a protein and I have called it Fred or something like that. That's all, um, that's all we know. We know nothing about, well, that's all we know. Um, but what we would probably then, what we probably do need to know actually about our samples, and this has been uh, touched on before by Simon, I think, and uh, some other talkers today, is that we need to know a lot more than it's just called Fred. We need to know details of its production and its purification, so how it was um, expressed and purified, how it was crystallized, um, other information about the experiment, the temperature and the pressure at which it was done. Well, we don't do many uh, experiments at anything but um, uh, atmospheric pressure, but um, I think they will come eventually in MX. We, we say nothing about the experiment type, IB here stands for inverse beam, so for a mad experiment or a sad experiment, if we collect data in a particular way. Or if we've collected data in using a helical mode, so we translate the crystal through the beam while we're collecting data rather than it just being static. We also don't know anything about heavy atom soaking, ligand soaking, or cryoprotection, or any, any of the steps before the crystal is actually put on the, the beam line. Um, and to my mind, this is something that we do need because I guess at the end of the day, we want to be able to make sure that the crystal structure here is commensurate with the data here and that people just haven't made it up, which doesn't happen often, but um, well, there you go. So this means that I5B or any other metadata catalog um, needs to be connected to other databases. 
Um, so protein uh, production and purification databases, crystallization databases uh, such as uh, CRIMS, which is uh, the database for the HTX platform, that's the high throughput crystallography platform in the Partnership for Structural Biology at the SRF. And then all the stuff about post-crystallization, what we've done with the crystal, have we soaked it, have we cut it in half, have we done this, um, or whatever, yeah. All this needs to go into iSpyB, and then we need to combine all this metadata with the raw images to make sure that the final structure is the one we should be getting. Um, a problem with iSpyB and with most metadata catalogues is that each synchrotron site has its own iSpyB. So Diamond has its own specific database, which is specific to Diamond, the SRF. iSpyB database is specific to the SRF, uh, Petra 3, Soleil. Anyway, they all have their own versions of iSpyB. Um, and for non users, basically, to get information out of these things is near impossible, actually, or, and or beamline managers. So what needs to be done really is that all the metadata contained in all of these different ice by bees needs to be, in my opinion, put into a really, really big database, pan-European perhaps, um, um, where it can be more easily accessed by, by non-users. And then of course we have the problem about archiving all the raw images uh, for all, exper all M experiments either in Europe or in the world. So you end up with something that may or may not be uh, tractable. To do. So that's uh, basically the end of my talk. Uh, the conclusions are that the metadata, the metadata required in order to make raw data from our beamlines intelligible and not extensive actually, you don't need that much uh, data, um, particularly for the, if you're just describing the data collection step, and they're archived and retrievable in iSpyB for users at any rate, yeah? And this metadata describes the experiment carried out on a given sample enables users to understand what's happened during automatic data reduction processes and it also enables the reprocessing of raw images by users. Although with the caveat that there's a, a time limit to the, uh, the length of time they're held on our servers. To make raw images fully intelligible for non-owners, we need more metadata. You would hope that users, you know, uh, the owner of a crystal, knows actually what's been done to it beforehand but non-users certainly won't know what's uh, been done to it beforehand. And so we need to let, have links to databases for sample production, purification, crystallization, post-crystallization, et cetera, et cetera. And this, there, yeah, I've just said it, it requires linking with ice by bee and other databases. And well, I don't know if this is um, what we should be talking about here, but as I said before, each synchrotron site has its own version of ice by bee and basically, something I've been thinking about for a long time and advocating for a long time, although nobody listens, um, is I think that we should have a centralized iSpyB I or the equivalent where metadata for all SR-based M experiments can be archived and retrieved. Um, thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gordon. Questions to Gordon? Vladek? Uh, I have somewhat provocative question. Uh, you said that every synchrotron in Europe, and I didn't use synchrotron in Europe for a long time, has its own database and there is no way to make any unification. I didn't say there was no way to make uh, a unification. So far, so far. Yes, but I, uh, but you see, uh, as far as I know, you have the best ESRF system, looking at the sample, is the best system in the world. Yes? And you really did something new a few years ago. And every beamline should copy that. And they didn't. Okay, yes? so, so my question is, so why good. it's so difficult? It's not, well, for some reason, collaboration between synchrotron sources, particularly structural biology, seems to be difficult to set up. Once it started, it works quite well. And actually, there is now a collaboration, it's called the MXQ collaboration, where 
all the synchrotrons in Europe apart from SLS and Diamond, um, as far as I'm aware, are going to be using MX Cube and helping to develop MX Cube, uh, develop and evolve MX Cube. And the same with iSpyB, actually, that there's going to be a meeting in October, I think, where we're going to finally sign some agreement to say that we'll all work together on iSpyB. Um, I think Diamond are going to be involved in that, but with some constraints or restraints, because they like their way, they like the way they developed iSpyB. Yeah. I prefer it to the way I we've developed it. My best collaboration, best collaboration is like in my life. Yeah, 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 um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think you're right, actually. Um, but that's the way this things. Two ways to collaboration is always two ways. That's no way to do collaboration when only one side can gain. Uh, yeah. Both sides have, uh, have to gain, and you have to take care of your collaborator. And you see, I am very unhappy that APS, except of Janet, uh, Jim Kabimlein, didn't, uh, and partly uh, 21 LS card, which partly copied your way of looking at crystal, didn't just copy that. Yes, why we reinvent the wheel? all the time. And you see that it's more than at synchrotron facilities or in groups, large groups, that they would like to build something on their own instead of copying solution, which is really great. I entirely agree, uh, Vladek. <laughs> I entirely agree. Um, but I think that problem is not going to go away, but I think, like I said, with the Ice by B in particular and MX Cube, there's going to be a much bigger pan-European collaboration, but the databases will still be each individual synchrotron. Yeah, what we but need why is a only pan -European, not pan uh, because you've got to start somewhere. Yeah, <laughs> we've got to start somewhere. <laughs> While the microphone's going over there, just to add to your sample uh, list, the sample name uh, should feature strongly uh, as, the, as the top item. And it should follow an IUBMB uh, yes, nomenclature it should, statement. People are a bit sort of coy about what they're actually working on. That's the problem. Yeah. <laughs> no, but to make the data intelligible for another user, then that is an absolute requirement. All right. Okay. I'm with non, you now. Non-negotiable. Um, if people won't share that, then you're not yeah. after sharing anything. No, you're right, John. Yeah. You're right. It shouldn't just be called Fred. Yeah. Yeah. So just just to follow up on your 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 previous points. It's, I think one um, one issue might be that there is a degree of competition between the synchrotrons in terms of wanting there, to attract users. Is, so of course we each want to provide them what there we is view as the best solution. Yeah, There is a degree of competition yeah. and I think that everybody involved has to sort of look at things sort of like rationally and if, say for example, because I didn't say this, so, oh no it's being broadcast isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> For example, Diamond have done some really good things that I think that ESRF should be using, actually. And I think, but vice versa. Yeah, very yeah. true, very true. Um, the point, the, so a couple of questions actually that I had as well. Um, the, uh, the idea of a, a, a gigantic database for all, um, uh, for all synchrotrons sounds like um, a nightmare in some ways uh, for the amount of different sorts of metadata you'd have to, uh, uh, or, or the, just for the size of the tables that you'd have to have. To have. Um, would it perhaps be better to have some sort of uh, common uh, metadata API which you could share across and then provide links through, so providing a, a decoupled kind of structure to access different synchrotrons databases? Yeah. Um, maybe, but um, I actually don't think that, particularly in terms of the data collection, the metadata that you need is massively different at different synchrotrons for, for MX experiments anyway. All you really need to know is the synchrotron, the beam line, and then all the other stuff. And you've nicely led into the next question. Uh, you're often, this might be a bit unfair, um, but um, since you're obviously talking about MX here, um, how applicable uh, do you think MX cube would be to um, a wider field, so into the physical sciences? Because we're, obviously we're, we're not just um, uh, MX uh, facilities. We provide um, facilities for a, a huge uh, range of different experiments. Um, that's a good question. 
Um, we already have a version of MX Cube, it's called BSX Cube for sax experiments. Um, you could imagine for small molecule diffraction experiments yep. it would be applicable, powder diffraction, um, I don't know, maybe even imaging actually, where you do sort of, yeah, I'm not an expert on these other techniques, but things where you do the same thing over and over and over again, mostly. Yep. Uh, MX Cube or GDA or whatever it's called would be, um, <laughs> would be yeah, why not? But then again, you see, this is like competition. There's not only competition between synchrotrons, there's competition between techniques and beam lines and stuff. Brilliant, thank you. If I may just comment on this gigantic thing. So first of all, I think Brian gave uh, the numbers for the might have even been for diamond, that the total for the, meta, uh, the metadata size is not that gigantic. And you're not, at the moment, doing the preservation of the raw data. Yeah. And a way to, um, taking Brian's point about uh, triage, you could clearly identify what raw data might be the ones to retain, and that could, for example, be those that you would flag show diffuse scattering, those, secondly, that are particularly medical relevant projects, and the public duty is to preserve those because they are medical related, and then you'd have, let's say, the rest. So I think there are, emerging from the Triple DWG discussions, uh, cases of raw data to assist this this feeling of overwhelm uh, overwhelming uh, quantity of raw data I mean I would actually start maybe at a slightly <laughs> different level anything that's published yeah you that's another way of triage yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly okay I think we move on thank you very very much thank Gordon. you thank you thank you um,